aware of the yeah. mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's talk about the immune response. So remember this beautiful thing? So we're gonna be looking mostly at this area right in here today. We've done all of the we've done all the innate stuff, right? So if we think about the immune system, when it's functioning correctly, it's gonna survey the body. It's gonna be able to recognize things that are non-self, and it's going to tag those things or going to destroy those things that are non-self, okay? So it's the role of two really important cell lines. It's the T lymphocytes and the beta lymphocytes that are at play here, okay? So if we think about this, right, if, does everybody remember the concept of self, non-self? Somebody remind me what that means? Antigen and antibody. Antigen, antibody. That's the perfect way to think about them. So self is you and everything that is you, and non-self is anything that's not you. And your body is going to recognize things that are marked you. And anything that's not marked you is going to be destroyed or tagged for the destruction. However, the immune system has to be turned on. And the one cell that can turn it on is the T4 helper. The T4 helper is the, is the central player in this whole thing, okay? Now, it's got a lot of help, right? One of the things, one of the things that helps is the major histocompatibility complex. Who can tell me what the major histocompatibility complex is? For those of you who take anatomy and physiology, come on, tell me. Chop, chop. Star H and A and B and so Oh, good. Yeah, but not blood, it's everything else, right? And so when you think about major histocompatibility conference, there are really four different classes. I'm only going to talk about the top two. So this is the major histocompatibility complex. And there are the top two as MHC1, major compatibility class one, is actually DNA that is in our cells that codes every cell, or I should say that labels every cell in the body. It puts those markers on the surface of every single cell, except the red blood cells, right? HLA, that's different. So it, it puts those markers on the surface of every single cell so that the immune system knows what's good and what's not, what's you and what's not you, yes? So there are four classes. The other one that I'm gonna have you know is the major histocompatibility complex two, class two, which are antigen presenting cells, okay? Now, what does that mean, Eric? Maybe a protein on the surface of the cell. That's what it means, right? Can I borrow this for just, are you gonna go to Japan? No. Okay. <laughs> so if I, so tell me if you don't want me to uh, approach you and touch you, okay? So I am a dendritic cell. And I'm coming in because I am chemotaxically attracted to that non-self entity. And I'm looking at it. I'm saying it doesn't belong here. I am going to get rid of it. So I come at it and I engulf it completely. I kill it, destroy it completely, right? And then I'm like, hmm, I wonder if that T4 helper knows. Because, you know, the T4 helper, it's just way behind her usually. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take a piece of the thing I've just destroyed and I'm going to put it on the surface of my cell. Yes? And now the T4 helper comes along. Come here, T4 helper. Make a receptor site. Comes along and he gets the information. And I say, this is what I just killed. The T4 helper says, ah, not seen this before. And it immediately turns on the immune system. Bunch of different molecules go all over the place. And those molecules are called cytokines. The cytokines basically say, we've seen this thing. We kicked its butt, but we need to be ready in case there's more of it, okay? So it says, all my T lymphocytes, I need you to be on the lookout for this. Oh, and by the way, my beta lymphocytes, I need you to initiate the series of reactions that releases plasma cells to secrete immunoglobulins. Do it now. 
Good. How many times do we get sick? How often do we get sick? Because our immune system And that's what we're going to be talking about today. But it is the role of the major histocompatibility complex and the T4 helper that does all. Now, you could say, well, it's the cytolytic cells also. That is true. But when I think about the triad, I'm really thinking about T4 helper, major histocompatibility one, major histocompatibility two. Those are the big guys, OK? Because with those working, then you have a great immune system. Unfortunately, if the T4 helper is not working and everything else is, help, is working, the immune system never gets turned on. Because the T4 helper is the only one that can turn on the immune system. So therefore, if something's wrong with our T4 helpers and everything else is there, we are immunocompromised. Right? And that's what is so wonderfully beautiful and diabolical about HIV. Because HIV takes out the one cell that can actually initiate the immune response, the T4 helper. Yep. Quick comment. You sh if you have Netflix, um, there's a show called, like, I Love History, or I'll figure it out when we go to lab. But they have a whole thing on AIDS and HIV, and it was so cool. I mean, it was just cool to watch now that I know more about it. And, and so that, that's really interesting that you say that, Ellie, and thank you for saying that, because had you not taken a class like this, you might be reading something, you might be looking at something, and it doesn't mean anything to you, but now you have a background, those things mean a lot more to you now. Mm -hmm. And you, I mean, just think about it. When you see the commercials for Humera or Emerald, right, those are things that suppress the immune system. And at, at the very last few sentences of this, uh, tell your physician if you've been in places where known pathogenic fungi are in the soil, right? They're talking about coccidioides, right? But if you don't have a healthy immune system, that one will kill you. <coughs> yep. They have been able to figure out a way to synthetically fulfill the same Actually, you know, we're working on that right now using CRISPR, but I haven't seen anything past, here's a great idea, mm -hmm. right? Um, because, and, and it's really from a cancer perspective. So if we can label the cancer cells as non-self and turn on the immune system and destroy it, we'll never have to use chemotherapeutic drugs ever again. We'll just destroy cancer with our own immune system, <laughs> with our own weaponry. Because right now, Cancer is not destroyed by our immune system. Most of it, some of it gets labeled, but most of it is labeled us. And if it's labeled us because it's mutated cells from us, the immune system says, you look funny, but okay. And therefore, cancer can be in our bodies for 20 or 30 years without us ever knowing about it, like my father. Right? My father told me one Thanksgiving, he goes, I've been having a lot of, I've been burping a lot. I said, you probably have reflux disease, you need to go get checked out. He waited another six months. And he got it, finally got it checked out, and he had adenocarcinoma at stage four. I don't know if it would have been less a stage six months later or whatever, but you know, it, it just tells you, you know, that cancer can be in your body for a long time without your body ever having symptomology for it. And when you finally have symptomology for it, it's way too late, usually. Okay? Any other questions? So again, the concept of self, non-self, if our body recognizes things that are self, it doesn't do anything to them. But if it recognizes things that don't have our markers, it destroys them. Okay? I have a question. Yep. Last slide. Which last slide? This one? Uh, that one. So on the bottom, it says all body compartments are screened by circulating white blood cells, except for brain and eye testes. Is that why testicular cancer can progress so quickly? And not only that, but other types of cancers also. Yes. Very aggressive forms. I was just curious if that's why there was this white blood cells right down there. Okay, so that's about the beta lymphocytes and the T lymphocytes. An antigen, as Tram has already told us, anything that's not self. An antibody are things, are proteins that we make to against a specific 
anagenic presence. And so therefore, each of us have a catalog of antibodies in our bodies for infectious agents and things that we've come in contact throughout our entire life, okay? And those things are part of the memory complex. So that if we see that infectious agent again, our antibodies can be ramped up very quickly. And so we, our second, our anamastic, our second experience with that infectious agent is usually truncated, shortened in time, and less severe because of the way the immune system works. Okay? What are the two ways that we can develop immunoglobulins against a non self entity? Yes, ma'am. Vaccination is one of them. I love vaccines because why wouldn't you want to take a little bit of something or another that's not going to give you the infection, but it's going to allow your immune system to build up all these antibodies in case it shows up, right? Yes. Isn't it being exposed? And, being, and coming down with the infection is the other one, right? Both of those ways are the way that the body, because the body doesn't know if it's an infection, an infectious agent, or just a piece of it. It reacts the same way. Right? And then we develop immunity to it. Remember, and what is, what is so confounding to me is a lot of people think that if we've been vaccinated against something that we're never going to get the infection. That is not true. <coughs> if we get vaccinated for something, it's supposed to help us so that we don't develop serious illness or death. But we will get the infection. Right? <coughs> a lady in, a, in the morning class said she's had COVID twice. The first time, it knocked her for a loop. The second time, she said it wasn't as bad. It only lasted a few days. And I said, well, you just got the same strain. You got lucky. Right? Because there's a lot of strains of COVID, and each of them are a little bit different. And if you do not have immunity to the one strain that you're dealing with at the time, you're going to have the full symptoms. Because the immune system is going to have to fight the fight all over again. Okay. Questions? All right. So two types. Two types of immune responses, cell mediate, that means cells are involved, and huberol, that means proteins are involved, right? So if we think about this for a minute, here's the difference, right? So if we talk about humoral immunity or antibody mediated, it's all about the formation of antibodies that are circulating in our serum. But if it's cell mediated, it's about the T lymphocytes and their direct contact with the infectious agent and the and the process of engulfing them and destroying them, and communicating that with the T4 helper. Yes, ma'am? What's the difference between, I know you just said it, but what's the difference between antibody mediated and cell mediated? Antibody means proteins are made against the infectious agents. Cell mediated means the white blood cells are doing the attack. And you want both of those, Valencia. You want both of those. Because that's what makes our immune system so unique and so beautiful. The They're being attacked on different fronts. Where's the proteins coming from in the antibody? Plasma, the, by the, by the, the plasma cells that antibody. are secreted by. So here's how it works, all right? So if I am the T4 helper and I have just been communicated by my dendritic cells that there's an infectious agent, I send out all these messages. The message goes to the T lymphocytes and says, hey, all my, my natural killers, I need you to come and help me. There's this infection, so they all come, all right? But then I also send cytokines, interleukins also, I send them out, and the plasma cells get in, they go, oh my God, we have this thing in the body, we have to make antibody. So they secrete plasma cells, and the plasma cells then secrete immunoglobulins. Okay. Right? So now you have all these white blood cells coming, and you have these proteins coming. That infectious agent doesn't have a chance, unless what, Isabella? There's too much infectious agent in the body, and then because then it's a 50-50 chance. Who's going to win, the infectious agent or the immune system? I'll take my chances with my immune system. Okay. Now, we truncate that a little bit by using antimicrobial agents, by using antibiotics to help us. Right. But in the old days, that wasn't possible. It was either the immune system won or the infectious agent won. Yes. Do you have like an allergic? We can, we'll talk about it then. Okay? Good? Question? 
So here is my most beautiful of all things I post sometimes. So in the bone marrow, right, these stem cells are released, they go down to the thymus, in the thymus they become specialized or they differentiate, and they become thymus derived. They call them T lymphocytes. They're thymus derived, yes? <laughs> and those things go on to be neutrophils, basophils, eosinophils, a bunch of really cool things, mm -hmm. right? Um, and then in the bone marrow, the stem cells are differentiated. Now, a long time ago, <coughs> we used to think the beta lymphocytes were bursa derived. What's the bursa? What's the, yeah, it's, it's the cushioning in between the joints. So early immunologists used to say, well, all these beta lymphocytes, they're bursa derived. Mm, not true. They're bone marrow derived. They specialize in differentiating the bone marrow. We just got lucky, Jin Jin, that bone marrow and bursa both start with a B, so we don't have to change anything, right? <laughs> so think about it for just a minute. So bone marrow, they're bone marrow differentiated or bone marrow derived, they become beta lymphocytes, okay? And they have a different function. These guys are gonna attack the infectious agent itself. These things are just gonna secrete plasma cells, and the plasma cells are then going to secrete immunoglobulins. Okay. Questions? Say it one more time. So B cells secrete plasma that create that secrete antibodies. antibodies. Yes. Yes, ma'am, Sam. She answered. Okay. All right. So uh, I do expect that you know what all the different parts of the blood are, but it's more a physiological thing than it is a microbiological thing. So I'm not going to ask you what's the job of the platelets. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> but you ought to know that. Okay. Of? Of, blood. Mm -hmm. of the different components? Yeah. Okay. So when we talk about cell media, I've broken it down. Now, there's a, it's very complex, but I've broken it down into three different things. T helper, TH, TC, cytolytic, and TS, suppressor. Sometimes people call the suppressor the modulator or the regulator. Right? They're all the same thing. Okay? So how does that work? Well, the role of the T4 helper, it, it is the sentinel of the entire immune system. It gets communicated by lots of different things that there's some things going on. Sometimes it figures it out on its own. And then it turns on the immune system, right? But if we think about the other types of cells in this process, the cytolytic cells, the CD8s, are the ones that kill things. Mm -hmm. And when they kill things, they are antigen-presenting cells. They are the second part of the major histocompatibility complex. When they kill things, they communicate to the T4 helper. Okay? And then when there's all these white blood cells in the body and the, and the infection has been decreased or completely destroyed, then something has to happen to all those white blood cells and it is that regulator, it's that suppressor, it's that modulator that brings down the numbers of those white blood cells. Okay? It is, it is a <coughs> immensely interesting thing to watch a young child fight an infection because they don't have the acquired or adaptive immunity that we do, right? So we have an infection, the white blood cells do its thing, and we're waiting for the cavalry. They're coming. The immunoglobins are coming, right? They just need to be turned on. But we're going to get them. Kiddos don't have that because they don't have the experiences that we do, right? And so they're only fighting with white blood cells, and their monocytes go up, in, they go up crazily. The lymphocytes go up crazily, and if they're fighting bacteria, the neutrophils go up crazily. Neutrophils always show up with a bacterial infection. Right? They're the number one white blood cell that show up. You should know that. They're the number one white blood cell that shows up in a bacterial infection. Okay? What? Neutrophils. Okay? So I'm not going to expect you to tell me what stains what. We do stain things. It helps us understand things. But nowadays, we have so many cool techniques, we don't have to stain things anymore, right? That's old school. It's, that is a rural hospital that doesn't have flow psychometry, right? And so you might be working in a rural, you might, you might, you might marry some really gorgeous cowboy. And you <laughs> might end up living in Papalota, Texas, and working at a rural, and you might be doing some other stuff. But for the most part, you know, anybody who's got access to a really big, institution, not just a new flow psychology, like that. We know in minutes what's going on. Okay? All right, so 
I want you to know that if we see increased eosinophils, or we see, wait, I miss, oh, I missed one thing. Let me go back. So again, look here. You see the neutrophils show up with bacterial infections. Uh, that's me. I, okay. So I got a new phone. That's, that's my phone. phone. I got a new phone. <laughs> <laughs> I got a new phone. This thing is heavy, and it's Are you it's team humongous. Now? Are you team Android now? Oh, my God. It's crazy. You're team Android now, though. Yeah. But... And he, the other day I was walking around and it fell out of my hand because I'm not used to something so heavy. And it just felt like it went down like, oh my God, it's going to break. But it's, 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 it's huge. This thing is huge. Okay, no matter. So, again, neutrophils show up uh, and eosinophils show up with pathogens, right? Neutrophils show up with bacteria, pathogen. The eosinophils show up with large parasitic worms. And then. Neutrophils and eosinophils are capable of diapodesis. What is diapodesis? Ooh, that's right, walking what? Against, against the walls of the circulatory system. So this means that white blood cells can leave the circulatory system and enter, be careful, and enter the tissues or the organs of the body where the pathogen might be. And you want that to happen, right? Yes. Because if you're having an infection of, I don't know, your liver, then you want those white blood cells to be regular there and take care of business. Diapodesis, be sure you know that. Is yep. it, uh, can you say that walking against or no, working no. against? It's the migration of white blood cells from the circulatory system into the tissues of the organs of the body. What's the in the tissues that you can Crawl around? Uh, they don't <laughs> crawl. They get pushed. Yeah. And so it's just but it is bumping up against stuff. Bumping up against stuff. So that like monster is gonna close. Yes. Okay. Yes. What did you say about parasites? Eosinophils. Eosinophils. Mm -hmm. I'll show you some examples in a minute. And you said just like your large they want stay off parasites. And and allergies too. And allergies. Yes. Mm -hmm. I was just saying the way I remembered all the the different they look like they have big eyes, like big bug eyes. So they're where they take care of Yeah. So here, if you look at it, increased eosinophils indicate allergies or a large parasitic worm. There are some people in the world that believe if they get infected with a parasitic worm that they are not going to have allergies because the high of the eosinophilia. There are vacations that you can take that will take you to these areas of the world where you can walk around barefoot and get infected with these roundworms and then come back to the States and potentially, hypothetically, not have allergy problems. But guess what? You have a worm infection, which you know, really Yeah, but how bad are those? Bad! <laughs> I would much rather have a worm than an allergy. No, not me. I'd much rather have allergies. <laughs> yeah. Yes. All white blood cells can do it. Okay. So, here is a little bit of a gram stain done from secretions from a lung. <coughs> Tell me what's happening. From a what? You from somebody's lung. lung. It looks like it's bursting. Huh? It looks like the cell's bursting. There's problems with cells for sure. So it, it could some. be allergies? Well, what is it? No, no. What look, is it? Look, look at the pointer. Look at the pointer. Tell There's me what you see. Coxie There's coxie. Where are the coxie? In. It looks like they're bursting out of the cells. They're not bursting out. <laughs> it's in they're the in, in, they in are the inside the neutrophils. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, so the neutrophils have engulfed them. And they're going to destroy them. Oh. Those are neutrophils. Mm -hmm. You can kind of see like the little border. That's what it is. Yeah, I see. So this. This patient had, guess what it had? Can anybody guess? It's a gram positive diplococcine. No, not that sorry. It's a gram positive diplococcine. Guess what it is? Streptococcus pyogenes? Not pyogenes. Pulmonary? Pneumonia. Who said that? Pneumonia. Number one cause of pneumonia in the elderly, 90 year old female. Yeah. 
here you have the application of the science. Yep. How infected was this person? Can you tell by Gonna the die. Yeah. They were, she was gonna die. And the son didn't know what's going on. He thought she had a cold. Is it somebody new? No, it was one of the patients I got to work with. Ah. Are the small little purple circles are the pneumonia? Uh -huh. and the bigger ones are the neutrophils? Correct. Yeah. Isn't that cool? The doc hit her with a really hot tacker so she recovered. Oh, and, then, and then told he told her son, you need to get updated on how to take care of or mother. She was an old lady. But she was feisty. <laughs> she slapped me in the face. Um, I have a question. Yeah. Is it like, you know, I've always heard that um, like when you're in a hospital, that is absolutely true. The more sedentary lifestyle you live, the more apt you are to develop infection. Things just, so if you just walk, your lungs start doing things, you get to cough things out. But if you don't, you always laugh at me when I do that. But if you don't do that, then nothing gets cleansed. Okay? I'm going to record that and send it to my husband. Yeah. yeah. Is he a smoker? No, he, he had the flu last week. Is he walking or something? Uh, he's working now, but he's exhausted. Yeah, yeah. No, don't don't make him go to work just yet. <laughs> <laughs> he works with his dad, and his dad's out this week, so he has to go. Oh, okay, well, then, you know. Not fun. All right, I want you to know the process of phagocytosis. Mm -hmm. So the process of phagocytosis, I know some of you all like to do these, what do we call them, mnemonics, right, or whatever. Yeah. Or these little acronym things. And so if you remember cake, you'll always know the process of phagocytosis. CAKE stands for C, chemotaxis, okay? A, adherence or attachment, right? I, ingestion, K, killing, and E, elimination, okay? So if we look at this, well, first of all, just appreciate, just for a second, this yeast cell and this, and this yeast cell here and this phagocyte, the yeast cell is roughly the same size as this yeah. phagocyte. But the phagocyte is taking on the yeast cell, and it says, you are going to die. <laughs> Isn't that cool? That, you, that it has this power. Now check it out. So here is, the, here is the macrophage, if you will, the phagocyte. So it is attracted to these bacteria because the bacteria are labeled not the person. They're labeled non-self, right? So it's attracted to it. It adheres to it. And it brings in the bacteria in a vesicle. What is the process that cells like phagocytes bring in things into the cell? Endocytosis. endocytosis. So through an endocytotic process, it brings in the bacteria in a phagosome, right? It now, the phagosome is inside of the macrophage, and there are these other smaller vesicles that are called lysosomes. What does lysosomes have in them? Um, and Digestive enzymes. Mm -hmm. So now the phagosome and the lysosome fuse, they become phagolysosomes. And the enzymes are released and they completely digest the bacteria. Or whatever it is. Destroy it. <coughs> it didn't have a chance. Actually, once one organism, or a few of them, but one for sure, Francella tolerantens, it wants to get in a phagocyte because it has the mechanisms to protect it for the formation of a phagolysosome. So it can actually replicate inside a phagosome, hiding from the rest of the immune system. It's a bad boy. What was that? Branciella tularentis. So here it is. So it's being destroyed by the lysosome, and then it fuses with the plasma membrane and releases everything, right? And if it's an, if it's an APC, what happens, Amy? Mm -hmm. They put it on themselves. They put it up. They, they put a little piece of it up there. Antigen percent. And so now it's an antigen percent enzyme. So now the T4 helper says, "Oh, I got your back." Be sure you know how to explain the process of phagocytosis. I'm sure you're going to see it. Okay? Mm -hmm. What do you mean? Yeah. Ugh. That was 
<laughs> so here it is. Here's a dendritic cell. Here is the bacterium. It brings it in, destroys it completely. Oh, and then it puts a little piece of it on the surface of itself. And here comes a T4 helper. I got it. Thank you very much. Cytokines get released. Everything gets turned on. You repeat that one more time? Yep. So here is the dendritic cell, uh, the killer. Right? Here is the bacterium. Right? It's, re it's attracted to it because of the, the non-self uh, antigens on the surface. Brings it in, destroys it completely, and all, here's all the debris going to be released. But then it puts a little piece of it on the surface of itself. The T4 helper comes over, takes a look at it, and says, oh, thank you very much. And then the T4 helper initiates the entire immunological response. Because the T4 helper is the one that recognizes that it's a non-self. The, the dendritic cell can also, but the dendritic cell can is, turn on the doesn't immune really have the ability to turn on the rest of the immune system. So the T4 helper is essentially not the first one that recognizes it, but the first, the only it one that's It is the power. Immune, it is the sentinel. Yeah, it has to sense that non-self to turn on the immune system. Correct, Linda. Yes, And the cytokines are the ones that say, okay, now we're good, we can slow it down? Or what the do cytokines, cytokines are the ones that say, need help now. Okay. And so then the, the other one, the... Um, the other one. I the other one. So do they the tell the T4 suppressor. helper to do it? T4 helper releases the cytokines. Okay. The cytokines then bring in all the white blood cells and they initiate the immunoglobulin sequence to make antibodies by, by initiating the, the beta lymphocytes to secrete plasma cells which then secrete Anybody's. And then the T suppressor is the one that says, hey, that's enough. When it's all over. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good. So, like, the T cell, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. The T cell would be like the captain, like, in an army or whatever, like, rally the troops, and the cytokines are like the, the troops. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, Valencia? I'm still stuck on part one. Of that. Part one. Because I'm trying to figure out, is that a bad thing or a good thing that ends? Are you trying to think about what now? The antigen, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, the, right here? No. Right here. Yep. Antigen's no. not good here. Okay. It's a bacterial cell. Bacterial, okay. It's in the body. Okay? All right. So, look what can happen. So, I just explained to you, this little diagram tells everything, right? Here is the antigen presenting cell, right? It is communicating with it. What is this? What is this? The T4. the T4 helper. The T4 helper can do lots of things, and it does them all. So it can stimulate the beta lymphocytes to, re, to release or secrete plasma cells to make antibodies. It can also say, I need a whole lot more neutrophils. Hey, my monocytes, I need you to become mature now and help me out here. So a bunch of monocytes. For, and again, it's really, it's really a beautiful thing to watch a small kiddo if you're a microbiologist. Yeah. If you're a parent, it's like, oh my god! But if you're a mic, I'm like, well, look at all these white blood cells in this kid. Oh my god, it's so cool! These are what we say back in the back of the room when nobody's looking. Like, look at this! It's just so beautiful because the white blood cells are doing its job. Like, come on, kid, you got it, you know. And then look here; it can actually stimulate the natural killers to come in and start doing their job. Most of the time, the microbes don't have a chance. So we go, every day of our lives, Samantha, we are assaulted by microbes. But yet, we very rarely get sick. Why? Because of this. Isn't that cool? No cool? Oh, so cool. Okay. This is elephantiasis. Elephantiasis is different than the elephant. <coughs> the elephant man was a mutation where you had all this excess bony pathology that showed up. This is an immunological response to a microfilarial worm. The microfilarial worm, the parasite, is called Wuxiera bancrofti. Which of the white blood cells that we talked about is going to show up? Eosinophils. Because of the parasitic. Because of the parasitic. So the eosinophils show up, and they go crazy. And look, you have all of this huge amount of inflammation. And that's, what's the inflammation from, like, the immune system? Trying to do good by the body. 
So when you, if you were touching, it would be like super soft? No, super hard. Hard? It's full of fluid. So you'd have to go in there, you'd have to debride, then you'd have to remove tissue, suture it up, and then give a lot of anti-parasitic anti drugs to kill it. And that doesn't mean that it's gonna go away. The most, uh, the most dramatic of all images about Ushier Bancrofti is a gentleman who has a wheelbarrow and his testicles are in the wheelbarrow because they're so big. I think I've seen that. I'll show you the only way to the only way to solve that is to completely remove, reset completely. But that does a lot to, of course, the man. Right? Good. So here, look. Here's a fluke. Look at all the eosinophils that show up. The fluke doesn't have a chance. It's going to be destroyed. And this is my favorite picture of all. And I made it, because this is my favorite one, Jen. I made it big, because I want to explain. So here is a very large worm. Mm. The individual cells of the, of the lymph, of the T lymph, the, all the lymphocytes, they can't engulf this thing. So they're like, oh my god, we have a real challenge in front of us. <laughs> and so what happens is they start accumulating around it. But then they attach itself to it, and they just start throwing grenades. Are you with me? So they release cytotoxic cytokines. They're being released. They're doing damage. But they're also saying, help, help, help. And so all these other things are coming, right? Eosinophils, macrophages, they're all coming. They release lytic enzymes, right? The lytic enzymes hit the surface of the worm, and they start to digest it. And then they release these perforant enzymes. The perforant enzymes, when they hit, they're so strong, they drill a hole in the worm. The worm doesn't have a chance because our immune system is so great. But this has to be in the body. What happens if it's in the intestinal tract? Mm. You'll probably die. Huh? You'll die or there's no immune system. There's no immune system. Why? There's no blood. So do they just kind of, do they end up getting nutrients from? For in, the, in the intestinal tract? Mm -hmm. Just and so you have one tapeworm, you probably have a lot. Mm -hmm. You get more and more and more and more. Eventually you become anemic. Right? You said that's because of the lack of blood? Makes sense. Because really, the intestinal tract, starting here, down the esophagus, stomach, small intestines, ascending, transverse, descending, mm -hmm. colon, that hollow tube is on the outside of the body. Yep. Can you go back the, to the slide before? The slide before. Because <laughs> um, we learned about, obviously, like liver flukes, for example. Yeah, I was yeah. just kind of wondering, whenever the calcification happens, is that what that is initially to? Or calcification, is different process. Different process. Like so this would happen when it's calcified. All these eosinophils that come in and start to destroy it. Oh, so but the calcifications just mean it was there. It sequestered it. Right? Yeah. But now the eosinophils is destroyed. Okay, so first calcification and then eosinophils try to... And sometimes the calcifications do not allow the eosinophils to do their job. Why? Because I was wondering, because they... Because it covers them completely. That's what I was wondering, because when you showed us a picture, that was the entire tube still exists in Okay. Right. So our, our body has a lot of defenses. One of them sometimes moves in right away and takes care of business, and then the others can't get there. Right. Same thing with tuberculosis and the lungs. You have gone tuberculosis. Same thing. Yep. So is it fair to say that in this example that we have on the right, that, yeah, that there's different, um, like pretty much other white blood cells come in and help? Except neutrophils aren't going to Except come. neutrophils, okay. They're not going to come. Basophils might, but basophils would come in and really start the flushing mechanisms, right? Mm -hmm. So you're more likely to see a lot of basophils when histamines get released, right? So you sneezing attacks, right, basophils. It's an Why amazing process. Huh? Why not neutrophils? Why not neutrophils? Because they, they show up with bacteria. States, 
because usually it's a nutritional deficiency that causes anemia than a parasite. But if there's other, Samantha, that's a great question. If there's other indicators that there might be a parasite, we can do, we can do an OMP. We can look for the parasite. But it's not, I mean, for somebody that's anemic, there's probably some type of nutritional thing that's going on. Women, as they get older and become menopausal, they tend to become um, anemic and they tend to have other problems because of the blood isn't, get, isn't getting removed and replenished as frequently. I don't know that it's normal, but it's it's not uncommon. I, I'm anemic right now, and I think it's just because I haven't been taking the proper nutrition, right? Um, and the only reason I know I'm anemic is because on Monday next week, I'm gonna go and see my physician for my kidneys. And I had all the blood work done this weekend, and I came back all perfect except my MCHs were low, and that actually allows for hemoglobin to be made and then therefore, you know, the blood can do its job. So my, my, H, my MCHs and my HC, HCs were low. And that means I'm anemic. So I started taking uh, multivitamin to try to counter that. I don't know that I'm going to do that right away. And he's probably, my, he's probably going to want to do a follow-up in about another three months or something, which I'm okay with. Yep. So right now I take a prenatal vitamin with iron. That seems, that's quite a bit. But I am anemic. And wow. I've been doing this for months, so I'm wondering if I should ask my provider for a parasite test. Uh, worms or you can, but I'm pretty sure you don't have a parasite. You, 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 there's no other indicators that you have a parasite. Look how bloated I am. That's baby, <laughs> hello. <laughs> I was so baby. That was cute, I didn't catch it until you made the fix. I was so I, I'm, I'm pretty sure. You can do that, but I'm, I should probably go, hmm, probably not. But I'm pretty sure it's, it's, I'm pretty sure it's nutritional because of the, because of the situation you're in, because you're pregnant. Is it because you, is it because of like lack of protein? Or I mean, like there's a lot of physiological changes that are going on in Samantha right now. I would love to, on a daily basis, take blood from her and look at her different hormone levels. I mean, I would love to do that, right? To me, and Samantha, please don't take this incorrectly. You know I love you. But to me, it looks like Samantha should have had the baby a month ago. I mean, she's ready. I have, I'm six feet tall. My partner is six five. It's going to be a big baby. The baby is six point two pounds. We're right on track. Okay. I don't know what else to tell you. I don't know what else to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> we want pictures when it happens. Sure. Okay. Anybody questions about this? Love it, love it, love it. If you think I love it, what does that mean? You know it. So here's a new, here's a new thing. When I say new tram, 25 years ago we figured it out. That's new in science, right? It's net neutrophil extracellular trap. Here is fibrin making these networks that they can catch non-self entities. And then the macrophages can come in and take care of business. Isn't that cool? Oh my God, we make our own spider webs. <laughs> oh my God. What else can the body do that we don't know about? Well, there's a lot of it. It makes nests to catch what? The, paras the, the, the pathogens. Okay. okay? This is an image showing diapodesis. And so. I expect that you'll know what diapodesis is, mm -hmm. yes? And then this is complement, and I've talked a little bit about complement. I'm not gonna do anything more with complement. Um, I'm just, I, I just think it's a beautiful thing. I just want you to know it's a group of serum proteins that can be initiated by lots of things, and all these proteins come in and can destroy. So just think about all my AMP folks, secondary messengers, mm -hmm. okay? So if you think about secondary messengers, right, you have one thing that comes in here and brings a signal in. And either camp or calcium or whatever is a secondary messenger basically says, oh, we'll take care of business. And then 
There's all these other, and then basically there's all these antibodies that are being produced all at once. So we can go from having minimal antibodies in one hour to having millions of antibodies in a couple of hours. And then the infection's taken care of. Mm -hmm. To the point that we might not even develop any symptomology to the infectious agent. Give me another immune system, please. <laughs> I have one. Give me another one. I'll take it. That's why I don't understand why people don't, um, I guess, care to build their immune system, like by vitamins and stuff, because that's a huge problem to me. I don't know why it's not a huge problem to other people. In America, their food is shit. We don't get anything from our food. It should be required to take like a multivitamin every single day. Because of this, this is why people get sick so much. Is because I mean it, exactly, mm -hmm. but you're so sick. like my husband has the flu, but I take so many vitamins to try and supplement my immune system. I didn't get it. My daughter didn't get it, but my husband got it because he does not take anything. You don't necessarily have to take a multivitamin, though. I don't. don't. You should, but, but, but you don't get ninety percent of your vitamin needs from your food. So, I mean, I we, we healthy, average. but I do take extra supplements, but it's not multivitamins. My wife takes a lot, a lot of supplements. Of natural stuff. And she's all into the organic thing right now. Mm -hmm. oh. has driving you nuts. It drives me crazy. <laughs> it drives me crazy. <laughs> so, we have two today. types of eggs in the house. We have my <laughs> eggs, which are just the cheap ones, and then we have her eggs, which are uh, cage free. They are pasture raised, pasture raised, <laughs> and organic. There's a difference. They no, there is a difference. There is no difference. They do taste different. Okay, different. so that, but taste is taste. <laughs> they have different How can I challenge you on taste? But what tastes good to you may taste the same to me. That's true. They have higher omega content. Only if they're genetically engineered to do so? Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> Let's look, move on. Professor, tell her to look into pure synergy. Oh my god, no. <laughs> <laughs> so the other day we were, we she goes, oh, we need to start thinking about Thanksgiving. I said, oh my god, HEB has, buy a ham, yes, get a free turkey for free. It's she said, here. we're not doing that. I'm like, well, why not? Hormones. That's what she said. But I said, they don't have hormones. Like, I mean, it says on the package, no hormone. She said, we're getting an organic turkey Ew. from, from Whole Foods. I'm like, oh, shit. It's gonna be like whole paycheck. <laughs> we're going to Whole Paycheck. <laughs> we went to Whole Paycheck. Do you know how much that turkey cost? Oh my God. You know 80 what? bucks. If they, add, if they add hormones and it tastes better, I'm all for it. Whatever. <laughs> so we paid 80 bucks for our organic turkey trail. But we could have paid free. <laughs> 30 bucks for a ham, get a free turkey. No. I might secretly go to H-E-B and buy a ham and a turkey and take it to Bastrop and leave it there. <laughs> so that later on I can cook it. You should do that. Yeah. So. I'm going to tell her. Let, no! <laughs> and, uh, where are so we know what side of kinds are. What are side of kinds? Get to another what are side of kinds? Uh, people more to kill. Recruit other things yes, to come in. So now it moves to humor immunity, right? So we talk about humor immunity. It's the formation of antibodies, immunoglobulins, okay? There are five different classes. And since I know some of you like these cute little terms that mean things, there's an old name that's not used very much. And that old name is Madge. And if you remember Madge, You'll remember all of the names of the immunoglobulins, right? M for mu, right? A for alpha, D for delta, G for gamma, and E for epsilon. The immunologist who first, huh? What was it again? It's on slide 38. Oh. Oh. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> so, again, the immunoglobulins are proteins that are secreted from plasma cells. And they make these proteins, and the proteins have all these really great things that they do. We're going to talk about them in just a second. Okay? But match, if you think about that. The immunologists who first named these things were not very creative. Right? They just followed the alphabet, the Greek alphabet. Right? And that's how they named it. But let's talk about them. 
right? So here they are, mu, gamma, epsilon, alpha, delta. This is not in the order of importance according to me. The order of importance really is mu, gamma, alpha, delta, epsilon, okay? And we're gonna talk about them in that order. So here we have mu. So notice it's a very big, it's pentameric, it's got five binding sites, right? The others are all pretty small. But this one cannot cross the placenta. The others can, right? And so here, um, IgM, mu, is the first one to respond in an infectious process. It shows up early. It does its thing. And what it can do, Christian, is it can destroy and lyse microorganisms. It can fix or initiate the complement cascade. And it can neutralize viruses and toxins. That's what it can do. But it has a short half-life, Isabella. It's only there for a little bit. But it only needs to be there for a little bit because the most important immunoglobulin is coming really quickly, right? Some people will compare IgM, mu, to the Marines. Show up first, do what it has to do, and then they leave, and they get replaced by the infantry, the ones that are gonna be doing most of the fight, which is gamma. Gamma is the one that comes in, and it takes care of business. And not only does it take care of business, but it is for life. If you, if you get an infectious agent or a vaccine, IgG is with you for life. And it's just hanging out, or it's in the memory of the beta lymphocytes, and when it gets initiated through clonal selection, through these secondary messengers, a whole bunch of them can be produced at once, okay? It does the same thing. It can lyse viruses and toxins, it can destroy microorganisms, and it can initiate the complement cascade. But it's there forever. And this is the most important. Most important, okay? And I'll explain that in a minute, Isabel, okay? Alpha does the same thing that IgG and IgM do, but this one is only associated with the mucous membranes, okay? Good? Uh-huh. But does the same things. It can initiate the complement cascade, it can lyse microorganisms, and it can neutralize viruses and toxins. Okay? Good? I have, I've been diagnosed with IgA nephrology. That means that the immunoglobulin A is destroying my kidneys. I can't stop it. The only reason I know is because years ago when I got the flu, my urine was brown, and I thought, oh, hell, I've got cancer. There's nothing else that does this. Well, IgA nephrology has it also. So I've been trying to take care of myself. Got a, an appointment with the, with the kidney specialist on Monday to make sure I'm all good. The last time he told me my kidneys were about 85%. I want to try to keep them there for a while, right, because I don't have to go into dialysis. Right. So, well, we'll see. I, IgD. IgD is an interesting thing. We know it's involved in the signaling mechanism, but we don't know exactly why. We know that it's found on the beta of beta lymphocytes, on the, on the surface of beta lymphocytes. We know that it's concentrated in the abdominal and the thoracic cavity. Why is it there only? We don't know. So there's a lot of things that need to be answered about this, which we're not really doing a lot of research on, because there's so many other things that seem so much more formidable or so much more useful or application-wise that we are looking at, right? So we're doing very little work here, okay? But it's there, and it, to me, it's, it's found on the surface of beta lymphocytes. It's thoracic and abdominal, but why? We, we're still asking. Yes? It's okay, I'm Okay. Then, IgE. IgE is found in the less concentration. It's like 0.002% of all the immunoglobulins in our serum. It's small, but it is devastating. This is the one that initi is get, gets initiated during any time we have allergies. And in some cases, if we are severely allergic to something, it can lead to anaphylaxis, okay? So people who are very allergic to things a lot of times will carry an EpiPen. My brother is very allergic to Vespid stains. 
So he carries an EpiPen in his car, he's got several at his house, and he has one of those little secret compartments that he has in his pants that has an EpiPen in case he, he his, the family members all know that he carries it with him. But my, my brother got all the looks of the family. He's very nice looking. And he'll walk into the room because he's very confident about himself. How are you doing? You know, he's that kind of guy, right? He'll sit down with you and he'll look real charming and things like that. But if a bee comes around, <laughs> he'll run, right? He'll, he, that's the way he is, right? And so one time we were playing poker and he was winning. So I did this. <laughs> <laughs> he lost concentration and I beat him. You gotta know you gotta know your your you, you gotta know the weaknesses of your of your com competition. Right? But you gotta do it when he's not looking because he'll look around. Love my brother, but I gotta you know, I gotta take advantage of his weaknesses. So this is what causes you to like stop breathing and stuff? Yeah, sometimes you're you are warned by IgE. So I can remember in college, I was dating a young lady who liked Fruity Pebbles. So I bought her three boxes of Fruity Pebbles. Now, back in the day, that was a lot of money for me, right? Three boxes of Fruity I'm trying to impress her. So then I ate Fruity Pebbles with her one morning, and I developed hives all over my body. Ooh. That was IgE saying, if you do that again, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> I have never eaten any cereal with any kind of coloring since then, and I've never had a problem. Yes. Right. Yes. Yes. Is that kind of the same thing? So per se, like I got like bit by like a lot of ants, and I had like a very severe allergic reaction. And my host mom is a doctor, and she said if, if that happens again, it's going to be way worse. Your body. So exactly the same thing. That's crazy. That's but crazy. have you ever horrible. reacted to ants like that before? So there's a different, were, were they fire ants? I think so, yeah. Okay, so it might not have been and exactly the same. So they have a they have form, they have a different type of toxin in yeah. them. And that, I mean, you probably had all these little blisters all yeah. over you. Right? Yeah. That might not be the same thing. But nonetheless, let's, not, let's just not take a chance. I have a similar, I have a similar story. One of my friends who was living in Philly got transferred down to my to my plant when I was working here with J and J brought his wife down. They moved into a hut of Texas or Taylor, one of those places. And one, one thing you do if you're allergic to ants is you never sit on the grass in Texas. Yeah. Do not do it. Yeah. So if you if you want a romantic with your partner and you don't go sit in the grass, right? Do it in your living room. Are you with me? So but she sat in the grass, she got stung by an ant, she started go <coughs> having problems breathing. He ran inside the house to get the EpiPen. It was not loaded. So he went to the refrigerator because they were, didn't have any. The box was empty. They forgot to reorder. She died on the front yard. It's, by, it's the time, by the time the paramedics got there, she was gone. I have I have four allergens that are highly reactive to me. I, just, I actually just went through an episode this weekend with poison ivy. And I have to go get my epipen loaded. But, but poison ivy is a different type of immunological response. Yeah. It's delayed. Well, that, I'm allergic to something like those type of plants so I, made, I had to get an EpiPen this weekend because I, my daughter touched it and nobody told me and I, it touched me that's why I sound so terrible and I had to get an EpiPen and go to the hospital but and so I'm, I'm not familiar with exactly what's going on with you but most of the time um, things like poison ivy poison oak poison sumac those are all delayed hypersensitivity so you don't feel them until like there's a few something. hours later. Yeah, there's something, I don't know, I have to go, I do allergy tests every six months and stuff like that because I'm so highly reactive to some things. Like I used to be really reactive to bees, I'm not anymore. But it's I'm not gonna tell my brother that, so I want him to be, I want him to be very afraid of bees. <laughs> my best friend has done that allergy and does like really severe and I actually was there and experienced her going into an epileptic shock and it's, it's, it's scary. It's very scary. Yeah, and she said that every time she gets in an anaphylactic shock, it like gets worse and worse. And this time she was in the um, intense care unit for three days. Mm -hmm. So um, another story, I, I was with my boss when I was working for j and and he's very smart. So we went for a walk, my, my wife and, and 
his wife and the, and the four of us went for a walk. We came back and something was in the air. She went under anaphylactic reaction. He took a middle straw and he stuck it in, in, his, in her mouth. Mm -hmm. And he told my wife, please watch her. You come here with me. And very, he was very calm. So he pulled out a little mortal and pestle. He stuck a couple of Benadryl and he ground it down like this and he put water in it. And then he sucked, the, he sucked the solution up with a little bit of a pipette and he went over to the straw and he stuck it down her throat and then he called 911. I said, we need to call 911 now. He goes, just let me do what I gotta do first, then we'll call 911. Because he knew what was gonna happen, right? And, and if he spent the time calling 911, he might not have saved her. But he knew exactly what to do. That's why we keep uh, children's Benadryl, the liquid. I have like a whole kit in my car. Yeah. It's an amazing them. drug. You know, yeah. so it, you know, besides being an antihistamine, it's also a sleep aid. So you gotta be careful. But you know, FDA rules say you can only you can only tout one pharmaceutical um, one pharmaceutical mechanism of action for each drug. So even though it's an it, it's an antihistamine and it is a sleep aid, you can't say both of them. Right? Therefore, Tylenol makes Tylenol allergy, oh, yeah. has diphenhydramine in it for allergies. It also makes Tylenol PM sleep aid also has diphenhydramine, but the diphenhydramine is a higher concentration. It's the same. Now my allergist told me um, years ago, I grew up in Dallas, and it, he told me years and years ago that uh, I had to keep children's, always keep children's Benadryl, because if your throat starts to close mm -hmm. up, the liquid's going to be the only thing you can I usually have. carry Benadryl in my bag, mm -hmm. not for me, but for you all. Yes. If one of you all go on a phylactic on me, I'm going to try to save you. <laughs> so yep. Uh, uh, I was going to say, some of my friends, well, only one of my girlfriends, takes Benadryl like every night to go to bed. And we, you know, we're all kind of like, oh, <laughs> like, is there, are, there have to be some issues with that. Not that I know of. Hmm. I mean, I don't know that I would take it every night. Yeah, no, she's but, quite dependent uh, on it. But, I, I mean, it's it's easily removed by our metabolic processes. Interesting. I didn't know that it was it it's pretty good classified as a sleeping agent. Yeah. And my sister-in-law. So, I mean, you know, you hear stories about, um, you know, adults giving it a little bit to their kids to make them drowsy. No, I don't think that that's cool. <laughs> yeah. My mom definitely talks about doing that. Yeah. So she had four kids. Like, I don't know what you're doing, but. <laughs> I, I get it. I get it that the parents need a little bit of. <coughs> I don't know about. You don't have kids. You don't I don't know about. Yeah. yeah. It's a so, I did want you to see this. I'm not going to expect you to know the morphology of all the different immunoglobulins, but I just wanted you to just see how much of them are in the serum. So IgG, remember I said IgG was the most important? Yeah. Well look, it's 80% of the serum immunoglobulins. Here's IgA, 13%, IgM, 6%, IgD, 1%, and look at IgE, 0.002%. The IgE was one of the important ones, wasn't it? No. It's the last It is the one that is the hypersensitivity when someone can react and cause you troubles. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean to kill you, it's just trying to save your life. Yeah. But sometimes it overreacts. Okay? <laughs> I have a question. Yeah. It, is IgE part of the reason that when you do have anaphylactic shock, you have to go to the hospital afterwards? Because I know like, I have to go F every semester I have an EpiPen. You just want to, they want to be sure that, that the that the sequence of events have kind of calmed Chilled down. Out. You're not going to, you're not going to. That's why they take blood and everything. Right. They want to be sure. Because that could be a real serious problem. So I want you to be able to explain this on an exam. So here is the first, who can explain? Anybody, can anybody explain this? All y'all took a and one should be able to explain this. Go. <coughs> Like explain the whole thing or yeah, like each one thing. in particular. Start okay. here. So basically there's a latent stage. Oh, yeah, start here. Right right there? Okay, yeah. At the latent stage, that's when you first get exposed to whatever it is that's causing your body. You don't really realize. Or, or you get a vaccine. Or you get a vaccine and your body's just like, okay, hi, there's something here. And then all of a sudden it just bursts into action because it's like, okay, this is not you. What the hell? And then it's like going into alert mode. So IgM shows up because IgM shows up and it does its thing. And followed by IgG. This is a total immunological response, right? Right. So then, years or months, months or years later, right, 
either you had a vaccine or you had the infection. So months or years later, anomastically, you're exposed to the same thing. Now, what happens here? The second time that you get exposed, your body's like, hey, I recognize this, but we're not gonna play games with it. We're just gonna like flood it and like mush it out. So it like goes into an extreme response where it just sends all that it can to completely take it over because it recognizes it. Through memory. Through memory, mm -hmm. sort of. That yeah. is a beautifully said. Let's say it more scientifically, you ready? Yeah. So here, anamastically, second response, IgM shows up because IgM shows up. It's like, I gotta do my job, I gotta do my job. And then it looks around and says, look at all this IgG, because IgG is fulminant. It shows up, and a secondary response, it is there because of clonal selection and secondary, secondary messengers, it floods everything, right? Therefore, if you've had an infection or you've had a vaccine and it comes in, you come in contact with the same infectious agent again, look at the total immunological response. Therefore, your second exposure or your second infection to this immunological agent, to this infectious agent, is truncated shortened and less severe. Now, why do people not want to take vaccines? If you could take something that will allow your immune system to do what it's got to do without develop any symptomology to the infection, why wouldn't you do that? Conspiracy. That's what it is. All the heavy metals, Professor. You didn't know oh my God. So, so a year ago, I had an anti vaxxer in the class. And she was a problem. <coughs> because every day she would come in was something that she wanted to talk about that was about vaccines, right? And she would lay it on thick. And I would, every time she said something, I was like, no, 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 no. So then she got smart and somebody coached her and she brought in, uh, she said, now I've got a bunch of papers that I would like for you to read. So she thought she was going to intimidate me by sending me 2,000 articles that I could read. Uh -huh. So she sent me she sent me an email with like a big old long list of them. And then the audacity of this young lady, she showed up the next day to class, she said, did you read all the articles I sent you? She knew the answer was gonna be no. So what I said, well, I said no, because there's a lot of them. I tell you what though, if you will give me your two favorite ones, I will read those. And she had no response. Why? She had never read them. She was just, somebody was coaching her to say, make them look bad, do this, right? See, there's a difference between like an academic debate and just an argument. Because yeah. my mother in law, she, she got into all that stuff. And like my daughter is about to be four. She's, when on the 30th, I'm going to take her, she's going to have to get three or four shots. You know what? I don't follow it because I really don't care. Like, I don't really follow exactly what they are until I get there. I'm too busy. But, like, I'm not going to sit here and stress my life over, oh, what's my daughter, what's going to happen to me? But what, what I will business. tell people, if they have a small kiddo, especially somebody with an attitude, like a little Miss Attitude, <laughs> but um, if you have a, a daughter or a son and you're a little bit afraid of the aggressiveness of the vaccine schedule, spread them out more. And they will do it. It's all but, recommended. But more important, sit in the chair for about 10 minutes. Because if you're going to have an anaphylactic re reaction to something, it's going to be within 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. You're not going to ha have a delayed anaphylactic reaction three hours later. Okay? And if you're there, then they can help you. Right? Or if you are somewhere else. You know, the the I took my vaccine for the influenza about a two weeks ago. A little bit late, but I just hadn't had time. And the ladies, the gentleman who gave me the shot said, do you want to sit here for a couple of minutes? I'm like, no, I'm not going to have a reaction at all. I got to go do some shopping because I did it at HEB. So he said, well, let me know if you have any kind of problem. I'm like, you will be the first to know. <laughs> but I went to my shopping and then by the time I knew it, I was done. I had no, no problem at all. My mother-in-law told me to watch because uh, when my daughter was younger, because she was afraid she was going to get on to so all those things have completely been debunked, but um, there's a lot of, there is a lot, and we'll talk about vaccines next time, because we don't have time today. But we're going to talk about vaccines, and hope we, hopefully we can have, I will present the information from a scientific perspective. <coughs> I am not here to change your mind. If you do not like vaccines, I'm not here to try to change your mind. 
I just want you to know the science behind it. And I will explain the science behind it. Okay? And if that doesn't if that doesn't change your mind, then that's cool. I don't have a problem with that. But I don't I don't want you all to be involved with some of these things that are out there that really are not scientifically motivated. They're politically motivated most of the time. And there's no real science behind it. So that young lady finally said, well, what do you think about Dr. So-and-so's work? I'm like, well, I know about Dr. So-and-so's work, and I can tell you that he's been arrested two times for actually peddling things that don't work. So, you it know, yeah, and so it shut her down. So then she went on HCT, azithromycin treatment, and how that's supposed to be helpful. I'm like, actually, there are three different clinical trials that had to be stopped early because people were getting really sick with HCT. I said, think about it, an anti-malarial drug and an antibacterial drug fighting a virus. It doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. So then she went on to ivermectin. And by the time, she, by the time she, she threw everything at me, and I, you're not gonna win a debate on vaccines with me. No. Just not gonna <laughs> so I'm just gonna say I just know too much, I used to make them. So I just know way too much about them. Well, it's just one of those things, you know, you, you can chat about it, but just don't argue. Oh, I know. And, and so then the last thing she brought up again was thimerosal. And I'm like, oh, poor girl. <laughs> so she said, well, you know, thimerosal is, is known, um, it's a known neurotoxin. I'm like, all mercury is. <laughs> so I said, but the amount of mercury that you can get from a vaccine that has thimerosal, and I said, and you know, think about it, right? She says, well, autism's related. I'm like, man, nah. so be careful here. I said, when autism first started to, we started to look at it, right? Autism was defined as, you know, this, you know? It was this real simple thing. It, this was the diagnosis. But now autism is a spectrum. And she said, well, the cases of autism has gone up, have skyrocketed since we started using thimerosal. I'm like, no. I said, in the 1980s, in the it. 1980s, we used to use the thimerosal, but we took it out for almost 20 years because people weren't sure of it. So we weren't using it for 20 years. But yet, the numbers of autism went up. And she said, well, explain that. Because she thought she had me then. I said, well, because we changed the definition of autism and we made it a spectrum. So if it's a spectrum, there's going to be a whole lot more cases, don't you think? Mm -hmm. She was like, well, in, so then can. she said, well, you know, I just think it's really bad. I'm like, well, I see you. I, and so I shouldn't have done this, but I did because I was grumpy at the time. <laughs> I said, I see that you have several tattoos. She goes, yes, I'm very proud of them. Not FDA approved. I said, <laughs> well, I said, I said, well, the colors of the tattoos of your tattoos indicate to me that you have a lot of uh, heavy metals in those tattoos. I said. From one of those tattoos, you've gotten more heavy metals in your body than you would ever get if you were to use thimerosal for every single vaccine you ever took. Silence. She had no comeback to that. And then after that, thank God, <laughs> <laughs> the final exam was about. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, she she was very bright. She made an A in the course. But, you know, she made a D because she was just... I mean, no. She, <laughs> she, in that, from my perspective, she made a D because she she just didn't she didn't really want to accept the fact that there's still and so then she had the audacity to say, "Will you write me a letter of recommendation?" And I said, "I just can't." What was she going for? Nursing. Oh my god. I said, "I just can't." I said, "I don't think anybody who's an anti-vaxxer should be a nurse." You can't. Well, no. if you don't, we have them. Oh my but God. listen, if you if you are anti-vaxxer, you don't look at the science behind things. So why let them? I don't know. My what wife, ignorance. my wife said, I don't want you to talk about vaccines in class anymore. I'm like, why? I said, I'm giving the scientific perspective. My, she said, it doesn't make a difference. They think that you're making them look bad. Oh, and by the way, this lady in my evaluation said, he is very opinionated, and he only says things about vaccines that are not true, and, you know, all this kind of stuff. Right? I'm like, oh, my God. So that's just the way it is with some people, right? So here's the last slide. So immunoglobulins can fix complement. That means that they can attack and destroy 
non-self, right? They are options that can, when, uh, that's the first word I've used, the first time I've used that word, option. That means they can surround the infectious agent so that the agent can't do anything and therefore it's easily phagocytized, right? It can neutralize viruses and toxins and it can form agglutination. Where have you seen agglutination form with an antibody antigen reaction? In the lab. Which test? Coagulation. We haven't done coagulation. The blood. Staphylotech. Staphylotech. I was trying to think of the name. I was trying to think how to say it. So we'll stop there for today.